Welcome to our third event of the third Borders and Migrations Week. Um, uh, and this uh, year is our sesquicentennial version of Borders and Migrations Week. And um, what does sesquicentennial have to do with this? It's because we were founded, right, 150 years ago as a Jesuit institution to serve migrants. In that case, it was German and Polish migrants. And we're a border city that um, houses one of only two Jesuit institutions at a border, the other's in Detroit. And so in honor of our position, both geographically and historically, it seems appropriate that we um, engage directly with borders and migrations on a more intentional level. And um, also Buffalo has experienced a unique renaissance in large part to the influx of people crossing borders and migrating. I think it's appropriate to pay homage to that as well. Um, so Borders and Migrations Week is sponsored by a whole bunch of people who somehow managed to work together, uh, including the Department of Modern Languages, International Relations, Sociology, the Bauhaus Library, uh, the VP for Academic Affairs, Latin American Studies, the Office of Mission and Identity, Sigma Delta P, the Spanish Honor Society, Institute for Global Engagement, the Institute for the Study of Human Animal Relations, and Campus Ministry, which I think is a testament to uh, a lot of good cooperative people on campus that I think is something to be proud of and something unique uh, to uh, Canisius. Um, for those of you that are interested, there are more flyers in the back that lists all the events for the rest of this week. And for those of you of a generation that know what QR codes are and use them, there are two QR codes on the, the flyer. One leads you to our uh, border page where you can find all sorts of events and videos and a toolkit for those of you that are interested in further pursuit of information about borders and migrations. And the other ones for those of you with deep pockets is to make connections. So we can continue doing Borders and Migrations Week. Uh, and also in the back is a flyer and an application for the campus ministry trip to uh, El Salvador and the Kino border. The deadline is this Friday, um, which is a really good um, immersive experience. Um, I've been on it three times. Uh, our speaker tonight was also on it two years ago. Three, or three years ago. Uh, several students um, have been on it, so I would encourage you to think about it. And if you have questions about it, you can contact Caitlin Bielman here, our, one of our directors of campus ministry, a former student of mine. Just want to put that plug in there. Uh, our speaker tonight um, was also a student of mine. And uh, <laughs> it makes me proud to see how far my students advance, although now she's my boss. So, <laughs> um, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Uh, uh, Dr. Morris, who is now our interim vice president for academic affairs, did I get that right? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, directs a migration banding station and has done so for 30 years, often bringing with her Kenesha students to assist on research projects. And I, I just want to say, I didn't know anything about this. And when she was a student, no matter what the topic was, she managed to write about birds in my class. <laughs> and I learned how to say banding in Spanish, which is, I mean, why would I need to know that I've never, <laughs> but I learned. So, <laughs> uh, so now I know what it means when she says banding projects. Um, she's published more than 20 peer reviewed papers with 24 different Canisius undergraduate research assistants and continues to publish, I don't know how you have the time, uh, with several former students who are now ornithologists. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Morris for tonight's talk. Do I have to use the microphone? Will you be able to hear me if I can't use the microphone? Yeah, it should be. Able to. It's okay? All right, awesome. Can y'all hear me if I don't use the microphone? Because I love walking around. I hate standing behind the podium. So I am Dr. Sarah Morris. I am the bird lady of Canisius College. I wear that very proudly. And when Richard came to me and talked to me about Borders of Migration Week, he said, you know, we really would like somebody to talk about migration in animals, like maybe birds. And I don't know whether this is true or not, but I've made it true in my head. 
where he said, do you know anybody who studies, you know, like bird migration? Because he knew I did birds, but I'm not sure he had the migration piece of it. And so I, in my mind, have now made this as the, oh my goodness, what do you mean? I, I get to talk about birds and bird migration. This is going to be the best ever. <laughs> so I, I got to teach last spring, but I have only taught one class in the last four years. So you're catching all of my pent up, want to be a teacher again frustration in this room. So, so bear with me. You came of your own accord. I get to talk about birds. I am so excited. As Richard said, I am, um, I'm, uh, I was one of his students that I have been studying birds, uh, actually running a bird banding station for 30 years. That's when I started my graduate work. But I've actually been interested in birds for more than 40 years. And I was interested in bird migration from, uh, I don't, uh, actually from the age of seven. And one of the first things that I remember that got me interested in bird migration was this phenomenon. These are all individual tree swallows. That's what a tree swallow looks like. And this is a whole large flock of tree swallows. And on the coast of Georgia, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, on the coast of Georgia in the fall, the bayberry bushes get very, very thick with fruit. And you see all of these, these normally um, insect-eating birds get in these large flocks and come down and eat the berries to get ready for migration. And so on one or two days, you'll see these huge flocks, and the next day there's nothing. They have disappeared. This kind of phenomenon was noticed back in the 16th century. So this is from the 1500s, the 16th century woodcut of two ice fishermen. And what this is showing is that they've cut the ice and they have now thrown the net in and they've got fish, fish, I think there's another fish, and then bird, bird, bird. They had seen that birds were flying over the marshes and then the birds disappeared. And so they thought that the birds were diving down into the mud and hibernating overnight. No bird hibernates. They were migrating, they would disappear, and the following day they'd come and there were no birds, so clearly that's what they must have been doing. Well, that was the 16th century, right? So obviously we've come, come a long way. One of my favorite stories, though, is from the 1950s, which is getting longer and longer ago. It used to be not that long ago from when I started my, my research. But in the 1950s, the first people started estimating how far birds could fly based on how much fat they were, they were carrying. Fat is the fuel that birds use for migration. And so these hummingbirds, we knew that they were flying over the Gulf of Mexico because they were not being captured along uh, Mexico, along the, the, um, the, the main part of, of the country of Mexico. They were not being caught going all the way up through the Caribbean islands and into Florida. They were clearly crossing the Gulf of Mexico, but none of the flight estimations said they could go over the, they could fly on their own. So there was a huge hypothesis that they were sitting on the backs of bigger birds and <laughs> hitching a ride across the Gulf of Mexico. We've gotten better with our estimates. They can actually fly themselves. But this bird right here, this, is a, this bird weighs three grams. Actually, this one's the boy, so he might weigh two and a half grams. There are 28 grams to an ounce. So you could ship eight of him across the country for first class postage, right? This is, this is how little these birds are. And they are flying five or 600 miles across the Gulf of Mexico. How amazing is bird migration? Can you see why I'm excited by bird migration? So I wanna talk a little bit about bird migration in terms of the context of it. And one of the real questions is, why do you study bird migration? Why does it matter? How is it all fitting together? Half of North American birds are migrants. And that doesn't matter whether you do the species or whether you do the individuals. More than half of our birds migrate. And that's all kinds of different species. Everything from the Atlantic puffin. If I forget to tell you what any of the species are and you're interested, just raise your hand or just say, stop, which species? Atlantic puffin, the Blackburnian warbler, the um, eastern kingbird, the Philadelphia vireo, and up in the top it's an arctic tern. We'll see that one again. So migration is very, very common among birds. A lot of birds migrate, but it's also something that's relatively hard to study. Now this is one of my favorite diagrams. This was put together by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And what it shows is 118 species going from January 1st to December 31st and it's showing the movement of birds that are going up and down between South, well, between everywhere. North America into North America, South America up to North America, but all of these are birds that spend their summer in North America. 
So I'm going to get it started one more time. Here you'll see everything coming from down here at the southernmost tip of South America and migrating all the way back up to North America, spending their summer or their breeding season here, and then migrating back south. So there are a lot of birds and there's an awful lot of movement that's occurring as a function of bird migration. The colors are just saying what time of year you're in. Okay. Now there's all these birds. One of my favorite anecdotes was that when I was a graduate student, actually I was just getting ready to start my job here at Canisius. I was defending my thesis. I was, um, had one of my, my faculty mentors said, Sarah, you know, I'm so sorry that you studied bird migration because five years from now, we're gonna know everything about bird migration. <laughs> this is, I'm still here and I'm still studying and I'm still publishing and it's taking a lot more. So there are a lot of questions because this is a really hard phenomenon to study. These birds can be really tiny. Some of them are big and some of them are really tiny. Even the smallest of, of some of the technological advances are too big. Some of, the some of the technological advances weigh 10 times as much as my birds. You can't put something like that on your bird. So we still have a lot of questions about bird migration. And one of the things that I hope I'm gonna do today is to also tell you a little bit about how we know what we know, not just what we know, because I think that's important to understand exactly what it is that we're doing. I like to use this image though. This is a painting that was done by a Canisius undergraduate who got a biology, a bachelor's of uh, science in biology, and then she got a um, studio arts minor while she was here. She went on for a master's degree in biological illustration. And I was, it was so exciting to have a student that we were able to connect their two different passions together. Um, Dorothy Fatumbi. So the first way that we study migration is simply looking. By going out in the field and seeing what you see and when you see it. What species are out there? Using binoculars, recording the dates, indicating what you see, how many you see, where you see them, things like that. That's told us an awful lot about where birds spend their summers, where birds spend their winter, where they, where they are breeding, that kind of thing. But one of the big advances was the, the use of banding. So bird banding, and this is what Richard was talking about. When I talk about a bird band, it's not you know drums and, and guitars and that kind of thing. It's actually putting a metal band on a bird's leg. So up here you actually have two different bands. Um, it's it's catching, catching a bird usually in nets. The bird uh, flies into the net and gets caught basically in a hammock. You take the bird out of the net, you put a band on the bird's leg, and then that bird is forever numbered with that particular number. So anybody else who finds that bird will know exactly who banded it, when they banded it, and how, uh, how long ago that was. So for example, this is one of my banding stations. This is my banding station with no birds, so it looks very neat and pristine. And in here, I don't know if you can see all of these dots, there are 23 different birds in this net at this one particular time. So we get, we get the birds, we put the bands on their legs, and then we send the data into the bird bathing class. I wanna show you two different examples of things that I thought were pretty cool about the birds that we captured, um, we captured and somebody else had also captured. So here, we captured a bird that had been banded by somebody else. This bird was a black hole warbler. You'll learn more about those in just a little bit. It was one that, was, that had been hatched the year before it was banded, so it was already a year old. It was released in, um, it was banded on September 2nd of 1998. We captured it on May 29th, 1999. So it was at least a year old when it was captured. It then migrated all the way down to South America and we caught it on its way back up to Newfoundland. So something that allows us to see where these birds are going. This one is my coolest record ever. And the reason why it's my coolest record ever, it's a common yellowthroat. We banned a gazillion of these. And when I say a gazillion, I mean like tens of thousands of these. Um, so it's not, the species was not all that exciting. But if you look over here at where the bander was and where the bird was captured, the bander was uh, D.A. Coors in Darien, Georgia, and the location was about nine miles east of Brunswick, Georgia. That's Jekyll Island, Georgia the Jekyll Island banding station, where when I was 13, I banded my first bird. <laughs> this was the person who taught me how to band. And I caught one of her birds 
on my island off the coast of Maine. How amazing is that? I mean, it's just, now let me be clear. My banding station has now banded over 125,000 birds. We have recaptured or had recaptured from somebody else fewer than 100. We're not trying to get somebody else's birds. We're interested in what's happening in our location. But by banding these birds, we can find out more about what's happening in our location and put that together with what's happening in other locations. So this was just unbelievable that I had that as an opportunity. More recently, we've done things with telemetry. So this is a long-tailed duck, and this is a northern saw-wet owl. And these are birds that you can put transmitters on and then try to figure out where the bird is going, get more information about that, the individual movements of birds. This is one of the, the geolocators. Geolocators can, um, are also being used. They're allowing us to get even smaller. But still, some of these are way too heavy for the hummingbirds that I was talking about. We still have a lot of trouble with some of the smallest of the birds. But you know, when I start talking a little bit more about some of what we know, I'll, I'll talk about some of these different techniques and how we've used these. So when we talk about bird migration in North America, we talk about half of the species migrating. There is not a simple, this is how birds migrate. Even the same species, what they do in the spring is very different from what they do in the fall. So when we look at these, these maps, they look really cool and you're like, wow, there's a lot of stuff migrating. But if you take it down to the species, things change even more. And if you take it down to the individuals, things change even more. And so here we have kind of everything low, um, over top of each other. Here we start looking at fall migration of Hudsonian godwits, fall migration of black pole warblers. We'll come back to that one again. Um, fall migration of Cape May warblers. So see how that one, instead of going out over the water, it's coming down the coastline. Different species are doing different things, and we've learned this from a lot of these different techniques that we've used. So a couple of things I'm going to use today, I'm going to talk about short distance migrants. In North America, when we talk about short distance migrants, that typically means that the birds spend their summers in either the northern United States and Canada, and then spend their winters also in the United States. So they're not crossing down into the subtropic area. They're not going down into Mexico. So some of the species here, uh, ruby crown kinglet, golden crown kinglet, hermit thrush, American goldfinch, if you have goldfinches in your summer and at your bird feeders in the summer, and you have goldfinches at your bird feeders in the winter, they're not your goldfinches. Those are different ones. They're, they're di they differ between the summer and the, the winter. And then yellow rumped warbler and dark eyed juncos are some of our example of short distance migrants. So spending the summer up in the pink area, spending the winter down in the, the yellow area. Then we also talk about having longer distance migrants. And we tend to talk about our long distance migrants as being Neartic, Neotropical migrants, or you may have heard the term Neotropical migrant. That means that they're spending their summer up here in the pink area, usually in the United States and Canada, and they're spending their winter in Mexico, in the Caribbean, in Central America, or down in South America. And some examples here, Magnolia Warbler, Baltimore Oriole, uh, Blue Winged Warbler, Northern Water Thrush, Yellow Bellied Flycatcher, uh, Chestnut Sided Warbler, or Indigo Bunting. Do you get the idea they're really colorful and they're pretty awesome? I, I have put a lot of the really colorful ones in here, but I get really excited by some of the brown ones too. <laughs> so some examples of long distance migrants. The ones that are most known for long distance migrants. I study songbirds, so I tend to be focused on songbirds, but it reminds me every so often to talk about some of the others. This is an Arctic tern. Arctic terns breed off of the coast of, actually they'll breed pretty much whole arctically. They will go everywhere from, I think Massachusetts up into Maine, all the way up through Newfoundland over to Greenland, uh, Iceland, that kind of thing. And, but they're also in Alaska. And so you can see them on, the, on either side. And these birds, if you look, this is where they're spending their summer in the United States. If you take out your field guide, this is what you see. They're spending their summer here, and then their migration is here, and then they don't show you anything else. So this is what it looks like. Now using geolocators, these individual lines are individual birds. So that's not, where the, that's not where the species goes. That's where the individual is going. So the individuals that are leaving here off the coast of North America, some of these yellow lines coming down and crossing over to Africa and then going back up. They will make a figure eight migration and they will travel between 20 and 30,000 kilometers in a single year. 
20 to 30,000 kilometers in a single year. And they come back every year to the same location. I'll talk more about that in a bit too. Now, this one was the one that when I saw it, you should have seen me go absolutely nuts. Like, you think I'm nuts now? You should have seen me when I saw this for the first time. Anybody, well, I was gonna say, anybody know what it is, but again, at a white rate. This is a northern weedy ear. The northern weedy ear breeds in eastern Canada and in the middle of Alaska. And when the birds in Alaska, that's where I saw it, I got to see it in Denali National Park um, when I went there about seven years ago. So I saw it in Denali National Park. That bird, when it left Denali National Park, it would have flown across the Bering Sea, across Russia, and all the way down to Africa where it spent its winter. I had never seen one of the species that was in the United, that was in the United States and did the Palearctic migration instead of the Neotropical migration. So this is one going all over. So again, migration is not migration. And in fact, what's really cool is these are the Alaskan ones. Look at the Canadian ones. They're going across to, to the UK and then down to Eastern Africa. So completely different separate migrations that you see on these different areas. Bird migration is cool. <laughs> okay, this is my dark slide to remind me to talk about this one. When do birds migrate? It depends on who it is that you're looking at. So if we think about species like, I just thought it was really cute to have baby ducks. So if you look at species like waterfowl, they will migrate during the day or they'll migrate at night. Most of the species that I study, like this Blackburnian warbler, migrate only at night. And migrating at night means that they're migrating in cooler temperatures, that the wind is more laminar, meaning instead of having the turbulence that you would have during the day as the heat rises, and so you're, you're think about being on a plane and think about how it kind of like falls every so often. Now think about being a six gram bird and hitting a, an air pocket, right? So by flying at night, it's cooler. By flying at night, the air is better. By flying at light, night, they don't dehydrate. They're, they're flapping their wings like crazy and they're able to maintain their water balance because they are migrating at night. During the day, they'll stop and they'll hang out as long as, as unless they're over someplace where they can't stop. And they will, will wait and then pick up again the following night. So we know a lot of this about these, these species. Now this is an example of how we know that birds are migrating at night. This is the Buffalo weather radar. I know everybody thinks that weather radars pick up weather. Well, they do. But the weather radar actually picks up any um, item that is in the air column. That could be raindrops. That could be snowflakes. That could be dragonflies. That could be bats. That could be birds. One of my very dear friends got literally hundreds of thousands of dollars from the Department of Defense to, to get the birds out of the radar, to figure <laughs> out how do you do this. In fact, when I was driving in this morning, NPR had a story about how the Department of Defense, like this weekend, was mobilized because they saw this, this radar thing that was like, oh, oh, what's going on over there? And it was ducks. <laughs> so this is not something that is this is not something that's a, that that is um, unexpected. We know this happens, but we can tell this is birds because it's on the north shore of Lake Lake that's Ontario, Lake Ontario, and on the south shore of Lake Ontario. It's not in the middle of the lake to get started. These are the birds that started. They were spending their day up here, and then at night they started flying out over the lake. This is a radar image that is now gonna show them expanding going north. So this is instead of going in the fall, this is in the spring. And as the, the radar continues on, you'll see more and more of that line going out over the lake. And we can see bird migration moving and it starts just after sunset. And then during the day, we don't see this because the birds pretty much stop. Now I should say there are a few species of birds that migrate in the day besides the waterfowl. Some species that flock together will still migrate during the day, but most of our little birds are migrating at night. And some of this work is some of the work that you may have heard about that's talking about the, the disappearance of birds. We can quantify the number of birds in the air based on what some of these, these things look like. We also know that birds migrate at night. When we look at radar, we can say there's a lot of birds there, but we can't say what species, they're just dots in the air, right? 
But we can record birds at night. Can y'all hear that? Those are called flight calls. That's currently what I study, is the, the sounds that birds are making at night when they're flying overhead. And so those different call notes are used by different species of birds. So on radar, I can't tell you whether there was a black-billed cuckoo flying or whether there was a swingsuit thrush flying, but those flight calls are gonna tell me what species are flying overnight and the relative abundance of different species in the air column. That's, that's some of what we're, we are able to figure out based on some of this work. Recently, we have developed, we call this the, the Rosetta Stone of, of flight calls. <laughs> this is, um, these are different species of warblers. It's every North American species of warbler and what their flight calls look like. And we now are able to, to um, start asking questions about which species are doing which, which things. And uh, so this is, this is, I'm collaborating with the people that started this particular project and we're now looking at, at how birds are responding to different types of flight calls. Okay, a couple other things I can talk about about when do birds migrate. When we talk about patterns of migration, when we talk about the short distance or the neartic neartic or neartic migrants, like this is a yellow-bellied sapsucker, yellow-rumped warbler, northern flicker, white-throated sparrow, these guys come through first in the spring and last in the fall. So they kind of bookend the migration of the long distance migrants. The long distance migrants that are leaving from Central or South America come here later. They, started, they may have started migration earlier, but they've got longer to go. And so things like, those are, I know they don't look like it, but least flycatcher, yellow-bellied flycatcher, trails flycatcher, cerulean warbler, really, really awesome. Warbling vireo and red-eyed vireo. So a bunch of different species that spend their winter in South America and make their way back up here. But they tend to come later in the spring and earlier in the fall. They're being bookended by those short distance migrants. This means they have less, less time up here to breed. This means they have a shorter time period in which to, to reproduce, to replace themselves, to, to feed their young. If their nest is unsuccessful, many times they cannot try a second one because they just don't have time. They're very, very time limited um, because of this. But there's some really cool patterns related to this that most people have heard about. I don't have any cliff swallows, but um, tree swallows or, or almost any of the swallows, if you watch, you can predict approximately what day we are gonna start seeing them in April. They come back here at about the same time in mid-April every year. Things like the scarlet tanager, I can tell you that they tend to show up here the first week of May. In fact, I usually would start my ornithology or biology of birds classes saying, I am so excited because the last week of the semester, my rose-breasted grosbeaks are gonna come to my house and you're welcome to come, I'll give you my address, you can come see rose-breasted <laughs> grosbeaks at my bird feeder. Um, and I had this, there's this great, a student was trying to do a project with me, this was wonderful, wanted to see whether this, the, the hummingbirds could figure out the sugar content of, of sugar water. So they were gonna do a low sugar content and a medium sugar content and a high sugar content. It was one of the coolest projects I have ever had a classroom come up with. And they don't come back until the 20 something, the, 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 well, mid, mid uh, teens, which is after final exams, it would not have worked for a class project to actually get your, your grade done on time. But we can predict when they're coming back. So when we say, when do birds migrate? Are you talking time of day? Are you talking time of year? Are you talking about when they come back to this particular location? But we can also talk about site fidelity, and that means birds coming back to the exact same location. So I'm gonna start with this one and then I'll come back to that one. So this is a common yellow throat, that same species that I told you about that my, that my friend had banded, my mentor had banded. This is what they look like, this is a male. The reason why it's got actually four bands, so a silver numbered one, a blue one, a white one, and a yellow one, is we don't have to capture that bird again to know exactly which individual it is. That bird is uniquely identified. This bird was caught in the same net six years in a row. Okay, now let me be clear. This does not mean the bird was done. Okay. What this means is that when that bird came back, it came back to not only the same island in the middle of the ocean in Maine, 
But it came back to the same exact net, the same exact spot after it went down to Central America and then came back six years in a row. Now let me say again, the bird was not dumb. During the summer, we take down all of our nets. The young birds are going around and the parents are following and they're going back and forth and there's no net there and the bird kind of gets used to it. The bird flies down for its winter. It comes back and dead come and that net got put up again. And we only <laughs> caught it once, right? But, but the bird was in that exact same location. So when I talk about my birds, which I really shouldn't, but I do, when I talk about my birds, they are the, the same individuals that are coming back year after year to my backyard because of this site fidelity. Now, I, I knew about this for the breeding season because I've been studying this with my banding station. A friend of mine studied in Ecuador. This is a great cheat thrush. She was down in Ecuador in December and she caught the same individual gray cheeked thrush, I think it was four years in a row, in the same national park in Ecuador. So we know that they show site fidelity in the winter, and we know that they show site fidelity in the summer, which is pretty amazing. Bird migration is really cool. Hopefully you'll give this by the end of the <laughs> If I were giving an exam, that would be, bird migration is really cool support this with evidence from the lecture, right? <laughs> okay. So a couple other patterns of timing. Males arrive before females do. So up here, the males come back first. I actually give a lecture for, um, for, for the Audubon Society called Taking the Sexism Out of Birding. <laughs> and the idea is that I make people focus on how to identify female warblers instead of the males. But I start with, of course you're gonna be focused on the males because the males come back, they're more colorful than the females, and they're singing. It's like, here I am, look at me, right? And so the females, on the other hand, are coming back and they're being kind of cryptic and they're setting up a nest and they're being kind of quiet. But the males are, are out there trying, singing to set up their territories, to defend the territory. By the time the territory is set up, the females arrive and the males can now get amorous. <laughs> So the males come back, on average in a species like this, the difference between the average date for males and females is only about two to three days. But if you look at the earliest males and you look at the earliest females, it's about 10 days difference. And so there's, there actually is some pretty major difference between what's happening with males and females. And if you come back earlier, so these are gulls, these are blackback gulls, this is the female, this is the male, and when the males come back and they fight and they get all of the aggression out and then the females come back and they can get amorous, you can have babies. <laughs> and so then they can, they can be successful because they've gotten a lot of the, the territoriality done before, they get, before the females come back and they start de uh, developing their territories and having their nest sites. And all of this is really important because Food is going to be a really key part of their success. As I said, the, the, the neotropical migrants, like this magnolia warbler, is coming back later than the Nearctic migrants. They don't have a long time up here, and when they are here, they are trying to raise a bunch of mouths. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but it's one, two, three, four, five different babies that are in that particular nest. They can raise a lot of young because there are a lot of bugs up here in the summer. <laughs> And tell me about what time the sun rose this morning. And what time did the sun set this afternoon? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and tell me what time that happens in July. Not the same. Not the same. <laughs> As someone who studies bird migration, spring migration gets earlier every single day. <laughs> the sun we set up our nets every morning before sunrise. In May, in June, this was a bad plan. So, so I, so we're we're every day you're you're up before five and going until nine at night, right? Long days. So the birds, what does that mean? They can be foraging from about five in the morning until nine at night and finding a lot of food to feed these young and feed a lot of offspring. A really great opportunity to take advantage of seasonal resources. Another thing about this is that age matters, not only gender, but also age. So this is an adult male rose-breasted grosbeak. This is a young male rose-breasted grosbeak. 
the adults arrive back before the young birds do. And one of the reasons we believe this happens is that if he came back and set up his territory, and this one came up, he would win every battle every time. <laughs> so rather than wasting energy, it appears that these guys come back a little bit later. They have set up their territories. They see what's left over, but they don't have to fight further and, and lose a territory when they come back. That appears to be an advantage of the pattern that we end up seeing. It, it's probably not quite that simple, but we do see this so that um, in my backyard on my feeders, I get the adult males first, I get the adult females and the young males at about the same time, and then I get the young females. And it seems to be this kind of pattern frequently. And in a species like this, it's very, very obvious. Now, one of the questions I always get is, how do birds know where to go? It depends on the species. So something like this barn swallow, that's a baby barn swallow, you can probably see the yellow right there. That's a baby barn swallow that is waiting for mom or dad one to fly by and throw bugs in its mouth and the parents aren't coming back, they have abandoned it. That is typical. At about three to four weeks of age, the young birds will be left alone. They actually have already been fed so much that they weigh about 30% more than the parents. And that, that, is, that, that, is on per, that, that means that they are able to survive being, wait, why isn't somebody throwing stuff in my mouth? They can be bad at finding food and they've got this excess energy store set up so that they can survive while they are learning how to hunt on their own. And so these birds migrate based on innate cues that are probably related to, I should be going basically southeast. I should be going basically southwest. I should be migrating for now. And meaning for now, meaning they, they have a drive to migrate for about a month and a half. And so they, by that time, it will take them to where they need to go. They, in, they imprint or they learn that particular area. They migrate back to the same location, but it's a, it's a combination of learning that route but also having this innate drive to go in a particular area for a particular time. That's typical of most of the songbirds. The parents and the young do not migrate together. The, there is this genetic component that is going to get them to the right place, or if they don't, they will not survive. These are Canada geese. For those of you who know me, they are not Canadian geese. That is one of my pet peeves. Um, <laughs> these, are, these are Maine, so they're, they're not in Canada. They are here, they are Canada geese. And I don't know if you can see it, but do you see the little, the little guy with his little tiny wings that has jumped up in the air? Yeah. Okay, so he's not flying anywhere with those wings. But with them, they will actually stay together. And the parents will teach the young the migratory routes. That's typical of many of the waterfowl. If you have heard about um, the endangered whooping cranes, whooping cranes, they actually learned how to train using sandhill cranes birds to fly between behind ultralight planes so that the birds would learn how to migrate. So there is a learned component in certain species and there's an, an innate or, or a genetic component in other species. And it really depends and we, it appears to be a, a pretty important feature. Part of the reason we see the Canada geese are no longer migrating here, they have lost it because they didn't learn it. They had food. So do the innate birds tend to stick in like packs or flocks and with the waterfowl or do they travel independently? Great question. So the question was, do the, the birds that are, that are migrating using this kind of genetic or innate component, is that something where they're migrating in flocks or are they migrating into, individually? That's not, I don't, it's a great question and I don't have a really, really good answer. Because if you look at when bird migration occurs, it occurs on particular nights in very, very large quantity. Now, it is not Fatima and Joanna and me going, ooh, let's go tonight. It's going to be, wow, the conditions are awesome. And so the three of us individually decide we're going, and then we're up there making those flight calls and communicating while we're in there. So it's not really like a flock that goes as a group, but they do tend to, to leave at about the same time, mainly because of the conditions being really good. The conditions being good usually means that the, you've got tailwinds that are going to help push you in the direction that you need to go which will decrease the amount of energy it costs to migrate. Okay, now migration is really, really costly. The number up here, annual survival estimates are about 40 to 50% of the birds will survive in a given year. Now that's of all birds. 
keeping in mind that many birds are adults and they have a higher rate of survival. There are estimates that as many as 75 to 95 percent of young birds will die every year. So it must have some benefit or all of these species would not be doing it. Now that, that's during the entire annual cycle, but most of the, the mortality is occurring during migration. The birds tend to survive really well in the summer. The birds tend to survive well, but not quite as well in the winter. But the migration periods are the times where most birds that, that don't survive during the annual cycle are going to, to, um, going to perish. It may be as much as 15 times higher, the mortality rates during migration, um, than it is during the, the summer or the winter months. And so when we talk about birds, we talk about birds being birds of two worlds. Birds being a bird that survives in their, their breeding grounds and a bird that survives in their wintering grounds. I actually really dislike this because birds are birds of three worlds. They have their breeding grounds they have their wintering grounds, and they have the area that they're going to have to tra travel through in order to get to the between those two. So they've got summer, they've got migration, and they've got winter. I'm going to show this so that you can watch. Be watching the colors coming down here. This again is going through by week of the magnolia warbler, showing the pic showing where the birds are. Here it's in March. Soon you're going to start seeing it move up into the United States. And it's, yep, so now you start seeing the, the, the light where the birds are now being observed going through June. And then in July, August, you'll start seeing those colors disappearing again as they head back through. But they've got to make it between the breeding grounds and the wintering grounds in these areas where they do not have site fidelity. These areas of unknown, these areas where, where the world can be pretty perilous. One of the big problems is that we have a huge amount of habitat loss. We have habitat loss in the breeding grounds. We have habitat loss in the wintering grounds. We have habitat loss during, uh, along the migratory routes. One of the things I'm proudest of is the fact that some of my research was used by the Nature Conservancy to figure out which parcels of land across the Lake Ontario shoreline they should conserve. I thought, wow, somebody actually read my work. <laughs> it wasn't just that I was doing this, it's that somebody's using this to help in bird conservation. So when we talk about birds going between their wintering grounds and their, and their breeding grounds, we often talk about this as stopover ecology or the stopover sites, the place that birds migrate at night and stop during the day, and then migrate at night and then stop during the day. And these stopover sites can be really critical. They may be places that birds stay for several days because of bad weather patterns that are coming in. They may be areas that birds are avoiding being eaten by predators, like that peregrine falcon. So par most of the falcons, most of the birds of prey migrate during the day. The songbirds are migrating at night. The birds stop during the day, hold up, wait until night and they're uh, trying to avoid or one of the advantages of these stopover sites is waiting to be able to, to um, avoid being eaten by some of these predators that are also migrating. The other thing that's very critical about these places is the fact that they can be used for um, foraging. Now for most of you in this room, you are way too young to understand what I'm about to explain, so just bear with me. Ask your parents about it later. <laughs> so I took a picture. I took this picture of this species. This is a summer tanager, which is not supposed to be in the state of Maine. I have more, more of them sighted than all of the rest of the state of Maine together because of, because of my banding station. And these summer tanagers, um, this is a female. I took this picture back in the day before digital cameras, when you had the, the film camera. And I used an Instamatic camera, meaning I did not have my super good lens I was literally the distance from here to here to this bird because she would not fly away. And the reason she would not fly away is that she had not only used all of the energy stores that she had, she had also started metabolizing her breast muscle, the, the flight muscles. She would not move until you got so close that you were a true threat. And on day two, I had to be this far away. And by day three, she would move at about this distance as she started building up 
her reserves again and could respond to, to the, the threats that were there. Having the availability of food is unbelievably important for these birds. Now we talk about the food resources that a, a, a place might give. Um, I loved this analogy, so I use this one regularly in my talks. We, there was a group of people that were trying to figure out how do we talk about stop oversights and stop oversight conservation. So they talked about them in terms of three different types. The fire escape. <laughs> the fire escape is some place you need to get out when you need to get out, it's only used for one purpose, it's escape, and it's only used occasionally and only in the worst of circumstances. Your building is on fire. <laughs> There's a really big storm, and so they will stop and they will put down if they, if they need to. Then we have the convenience store. The convenience store is one that has food, but it may not be the best quality food. It has a place that you can, you know, find some water, but you know, it, if you are choosing, you might choose to go to a full service hotel <laughs> rather than going to the convenience store or using a fire escape. And so this has been one of the questions is what kind of stopover sites, what kind of places do we conserve? We're trying to conserve all of these because if a bird needs this and it isn't there, they will die. If a bird needs this and it isn't there, they will die. This is a matter of life and death for many of the migrant birds that are moving between these different areas. So I talked about birds having fuel. Birds will build up fat stores. They eat food, they go through hyperphagy, meaning eating a whole lot of food. And up here I have a black capped chickadee, and you can see a little bit of the hollow V right there where, where you can see a dip. That's where the, the um, wishbone is in the bird. And that dip down is between the breast muscles on the two sides of the bird's body. Can you see that there's no V, and in fact that is mounded up instead of being that hollow area, and it's yellow, not burgundy. The burgundy is the muscle color. The yellow is fat. This is a black pole warbler, and she has so much fat. This was actually, a, um, we, we categorize it um, anywhere from zero to four. This is a four, which means she squishes when you pick her up. Um, <laughs> but that, month, that, that fuel is what she is using to migrate from one area to another. And this is really, really important. Now, there are two things, actually three things I'm gonna tell you on this slide. The importance of feeding. First off, whenever I do this, I always forget, so this is my reminder. This is a black dirty green warbler. In its mouth, you can see a fly. While my hand, I was holding the bird in one hand, holding the camera in the other, taking the picture, a fly flew by and the bird grabbed it in the air while I was taking this picture. Because a lot of people say, aren't you harming the bird? Well, clearly it's eating while it can, so they, they are still, they're still doing this. So the birds are using this, these, these food resources to build up their fat stores that will allow them to successfully move from one area to the other. So there's always the question of really, can birds do this? How much do they do? How much does it take? So I have this oven bird. Because, and this, I know everybody who does lectures, you can get into this thing where you, you tell this you know, tall tale about what happened, like whether Richard actually knew or didn't know that I took a study of bird migration. This is not a tall tale, this is, this is real. I have had multiple oven birds where I caught them, you remember I said you banned them and then you want to catch them a couple of days later at our stopover sites to see what they're doing so we know exactly what bird it is and we can see how it was doing. I've had multiple oven birds that have gained 75% of their body mass in four days. Think about a hundred pound human being becoming 175 pounds in four days and then losing it all. So that's, I mean, that's what these birds are doing. They are eating like crazy to gain the mass that will allow them to go. Now that 75% of its body mass means that that bird can fly for over a thousand miles, right? So if the bird stops and it feeds and it gains 25% of its body mass, it can go for 400 miles. And that can make all the difference between whether it is successful or whether it is not successful. Now, I have, this is actually, I love this because it's an old picture of her. This is Christy Covino. Anybody oh have Dr. God. Covino? Okay, this is, this, this is her from when she was, when she was doing her, her master's work. 
So this is Dr. Covino. She is currently a tenure track faculty member at LMU, another good Jesuit school. She was an undergraduate research assistant of mine here at Canisius, and she and I are still publishing together, actually on this same species, the black hole warbler. And what her work for her master's thesis showed was if you ended up having birds that did not have a lot of fat, they were not likely to initiate flight. They were like, likely to stay at a particular location. If they had a little bit of fat, they might leave, they might stay. If they had a lot of fat, they were likely to leave. The coolest thing ever was what she did to figure this out. You know those glow sticks you use at, at Halloween? She used those glow sticks and she put the glow stick material in a capsule and glued it to the behind of the bird. She would let the bird go, and then you would use your binoculars to figure out, did it go into a tree or did it leave? And there were a whole group of us that were sitting up on, on, <laughs> were sitting up on the commons deck with their binoculars looking to say, it's up, it's up, it's down. <laughs> and, so, and then we actually double checked. Every bird we said went down. If we recaptured it, we were correct. And we never recaptured a bird that we said had, had actually left the island. So we were actually trying to figure out whether the birds were leaving or staying. Pretty cool. This species, the black hole warbler, is one of, I said bird migration is cool. This is like the coolest of the cool. So black hole warblers, we have known for years, or we have thought for years, leave the eastern coast of the United States, even if they breed in Alaska, and they migrate out over the ocean for 80 to 100 hours nonstop flight. We now have geolocators that are just small enough that we can, do, we can look at them. Departing on the 13th of October hits the Caribbean on the 15th of October. Departing on the 1st of October hits down here about the 3rd of October. Departs on the 25th, hits on the 27th. These birds are flying for two to three days nonstop. Think about running a four minute mile for nonstop and if you can't do it, you become fish bait. That's what every one of these individuals is doing. The other really, really cool bird fun fact, if you were burning gasoline instead of burning fat as fuel for migration, birds could boast 720 thousand miles to the gallon. <laughs> it's based on grams, but it's 720,000 miles to the Bird migration is cool. <laughs> now we know that birds do different things at, at different parts of the year. This is a fox sparrow. We know that they will actually do something called leapfrog migration. The birds in the north will jump over the birds in the middle and migrate further south than them. Things like the American Red Star, we know that when they get down into their wintering grounds, the males and the females segregate. The males take the good territories and areas with lots of food and leave the females for the areas that don't have quite as much good food. When the males leave, the females move into the area that has good food, build up their fat, and then they can leave, which means they get back to the breeding grounds several days later than the males. It's, it's kind of fitting all of those pieces together. This is part of how all of this is happening. And if you look at what birds are doing at different times of year, this is an eastern kingbird. It breeds up here. Up here, they are completely territorial and they eat almost exclusively insects. In South America, they are entirely um, a flock living and they eat almost entirely fruit. So completely changing their biology between the breeding grounds and the wintering grounds. Now I've been really lucky. I've had the opportunity to study migration for all of my career and to be able to, to work with students that have been willing to do things like this with me. But I want to, I always, when I, when I talk about bird migration, I want to remember that birds are not the only things that migrate. That we have monarch butterflies, red bats, so I actually caught that bat in my bird net. Um, it was really cool, it was a red bat, I'd always wanted to see a red bat. Um, humpback whales, if you didn't know it, salamanders migrate. Not like birds, they don't fly, and no, they don't go down to South America, but they still migrate. And so migration is a natural phenomenon that we see in many parts of the natural world. We even see migration in humans. And this is something that Joanna and the Kino Border Initiative changed my life when I went down there three years ago. Because I've been studying bird migration as a natural phenomenon and thinking about all of the, the, the difficulties that birds have getting from their breeding grounds to their wintering grounds and back again. 
And that's after tens of thousands of years of evolution to be able to handle these things. I think you heard about the complexity of what we were dealing with. And here we have, have people that this is not something that has been evolved over tens of thousands of years. And places like the Kino Border Initiative, this is the old picture, I guess y'all have new, new digs. No, we're still, You're we're still, still here. here. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're getting new digs. We are. Um, but, but the Kino Border Initiative is, is helping address some of the needs. Um, when you are there, and if you ever go, we are not allowed to take pictures of people unless they give us permission. And I actually had the opportunity to talk to this, this gentleman, Louis Jean, who told me his story. And hearing the stories of individuals made me think about how lucky my life is in terms of all of the things that I have and that, that my, the thing that I'm worried most about is whether I'm gonna get another one of my papers published about bird migration. <laughs> um, but it also means that, that um, when we think about the difficulties that birds, are fe that, that birds are having, I am now also starting to think about this in terms of what other difficulties we see in the world today. And one of the things that I saw was um, the, the areas of the desert where migrants are trying to cross and some of the evidence of the things that they were carrying with them. They may migrate at night, but then they still have to be there during the day. They're gonna be dealing with that heat that I talked about. They're gonna be dealing with dehydration. It really made me think about all of the things that the birds are really, really well prepared to deal with and how we as humans are not. And what are we doing this for? We're doing this for resources. We're doing this primarily for food. We're trying to provide our offspring with opportunities to survive. Um, this is the Kino Border Initiative. This is um, one of the tables where they would be fe feeding migrants that, that um, have come up to the U.S.-Mexico border. And then over here, a magnolia warbler um, with food in its mouth. They only carry food if they're taking it back to their offspring. Or an eastern bluebird bringing food back to feed its young. That, that in the case of birds, migration is about using resources that are available at that time of year. If you didn't hear about it, Something like 25% of North American bird pop, we've lost about 25% of North American bird populations. And that's since 1970. That's in about a 50 year period. And that's, that's pretty sobering for those of us that study birds. But Cornell University has put out a list of what you can do to help save birds. You can make windows safe by using some of the decals or even better, painting murals over them if they're windows that are not really being used. Keeping your cats indoors, it's better for the cats, it's better for the birds. Using native plants and avoiding pesticides, that, that will make it more insects, the birds will help take care of things. Reducing their, your use of, of plastic, and if you drink coffee, please drink shade-grown, bird-friendly coffee. You can, you can um, grow it in different ways. And you can watch birds and share what you see. This was from the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, and early on I showed you this. This was 118 species of birds. This data was collected entirely by citizen scientists who wrote down what they saw, when they saw it, where they saw it. There was not, well, scientists probably did it too, but it was only as bird watchers. This was not as ornithologists. This was simply recording an e-bird, what we were seeing, when and where, and we can develop this. You can help conserve birds by helping to collect data that will help us figure out what's going on. The bigger thing, and I want to thank Sarah and Jen and Andy for doing this, is to get people started young. This is my daughter. <laughs> She's now 15. But, <laughs> but this is my daughter when I was introducing her to nature, where she would, she would have a de develop a love of birds and ha want to conserve. She's, she's not going to be an ornithologist. She's not going to be a biologist. But she's going to want to have the outside be appropriate. She's a vegetarian. And I mean, and she has been for three years. She's 15. And she has been very committed for, for three years, um, partially because of cons conservation of the environment. And I think that's a really important aspect. I always like to end with don't, yes, there, yes there's a lot that is, that, that is tough. Yes, there are a lot of birds that don't make it, but an awful lot do. You can help a little bit and you can always enjoy the show of bird migration. And I just wanna thank all of the people that have helped over the years with all of my various research studies, including a whole bunch of different um, Canisius undergraduates. And with that, big look up.
We do have time for questions, sorry. And there is food. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably a very obvious, the answer is pretty obvious, because you said that there's a lot the breeding is up north. So that means like in California, they never find little bird nests around. So what, was it, so what I was showing was kind of this the extremes. There's birds that are breeding all the way throughout North America. So in North America, we have over 600 species of breeding birds. And when we talk about migration, I tend to be very East Coast centric. And I tend to be very, I, because I've done all of my research in the state of Maine, I tend to be dealing with the birds that breed up in the boreal forest. But there are birds breeding all the way up and down. And so if you looked at that, the map that had the dots, yeah. some of the dots just barely made it into the United States and came back down. And so oh. those are birds that are going to be breeding in the south. Oh, so we, okay. we have them breeding yeah. all yeah. over the country. Oh, yeah, yeah. So my, my bad. Josh. <laughs> yeah, so I, one of the things that I, one of my class we talk about is the political boundaries that birds cross. Um, and so I'm wondering, has is the science around the importance of stopover has changed? Has the sort of need to reconcile, because I mean, if you want to protect migratory birds, you would see you protect them where they can winter and where they summer, but now you have to kind of think about all those political boundaries in between. Has that changed in terms of bird conservation and the attention given to? That's a great question. So the way that I would answer it is, um, you have a bunch of political boundaries and they are not, they are, they are individual independent units. <laughs> Eco, tourism is a huge draw that can bring people in to areas where they would not have been in the past. I cannot wait until I can find the time to go to Colombia. I have always wanted to go to Venezuela and the northern water thrush, I showed a couple of pictures of northern water thrushes. I had one of mine that was captured in northern Venezuela and think about the political situation that's there right now. I mean, so the, the it, it's unfortunately it is one of the things that can, is a continual problem that depending on what's happening in different areas, birds are gonna have to be dealing with whatever is going on and what that means in terms of slash and burn agriculture, in terms of what resources are available. I didn't show it, but if you Google pictures, you can actually see birds like sitting on, on beaches in seaweed, eating the insects because that was the only place that they found some place where there was food. And so it, it, um, birds can only survive if they have the resources they need. And as the, as the environment is changing because of many of the political unrest or, or changes because we are not, are not working in an, in, as an integrated whole, that, that's something that's, all of that is leading into the issue of the 25% gone in the last 50 years. Yes? When we look at issues like climate change and um, I guess like other anthropogenic sources of um, bird death. Do you see that birds that exhibit more behavioral plasticity are better off? Or do you find, or I'm not sure if you know this, but do you find that across the board, when we look at um, migrating species, is there, in, are there like equal like deaths? Great, do great see, question like, and we the, don't have a good feel for this. Right, right. okay. So um, I, I can tell you about a couple of different things that I've been involved in. One is, if you look at the television towers that are south of town, I actually worked with a guy who, uh, who used to work at the Buffalo Museum of Science, and he collected dead birds under the television towers. And it, it is not equal. There are certain species that migrate lower than others, and so those are the ones that are going to be more likely to be, be um, killed by running into the guy wires around the television towers. That said, what we are now seeing is that we have seen microevolution, and birds are moving, some birds are moving higher than they used to. Primarily things like cliff swallows, they've actually demonstrated this, where their average flight height is higher than it used to be, and it appears to be a microevolutionary change. <clears throat> the biggest concern is whether there will be a mismatch between the food that birds need as they're migrating and when they get to the breeding ground, and what's gonna happen is the vegetation changes. And what we are seeing is that in, in general, birds are migrating earlier in the spring than they used to. Now, I've just finished doing a study of the black hole warbler with Kristen Covino on 50 years of migration in, this one's actually the black throated blue warbler. And what we found is that in the fall, migration average did not change, but the length 
has changed. So some birds are migrating earlier, other birds are migrating later, and it may mean that some birds are getting a second chance to breed that they would not have had, had before. Whether that means that certain species, because of what their timeline is, would differ. Whether that means certain species, because of, they have more availability of different types of food, there's a lot of question about that. We, there's a lot of things that we just don't have answers for yet. Yes. Could you <clears throat> talk about uh, winter feeding in urban environments? There's always the contrast of how much do you want to feed and what, what's the risk of bringing rats and squirrels? That's kind of the controversy. <laughs> how much do you want to feed? And, there, and you, you certainly can. If you're interested, if you're in an area where you want to feed and you want to limit the rats and squirrels, use capsaicin. Red pepper. So if you put red pepper on the, on the food, all the, the birds tend not to be affected by it. We, I, I used to say they don't really have, have taste buds, but apparently they do, but they still don't, they don't connect the two. But um, the, the mammals definitely respond to red pepper very negatively. And so if you have red pepper on your seed, you have a better chance of getting the seed to the birds and not to the squirrels. But, Pretty much, if you put out food, things are going to eat it. So my bird feeder, I have deer. They come to my bird feeders. I have raccoons. So we just put out lots of food and feed whatever comes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you all for your attention. I cannot tell you how exciting it is to see the room this full to hear, to see people who wanted to hear about bird migration. Because bird migration is really cool. <laughs>